everyone and um, welcome back to my channel. Um, in this video uh, I'm going to carry on um, reviewing uh, this book here, The Meaning of Anxiety um, by, um, by Roland May. Um, and um, I'm getting close to the end now so we'll just see how we got on and uh, if there's time left at the, at the end then I, um, then I might talk to you about some other things so we'll see how we get on. So, um, so yes, yeah, so, um, um, uh, I got up to page 329, um, just after I was talking about um, R. R. Grinker and Men on Distress um, in, in the last video. I got up to the um, bit on uh, neurotic anxiety and um, uh, how um, the threat um, must be present um, in neurotic anxiety, but not just in neurotic anxiety, but in all anxiety as well. Neurotic being anxiety that's um, kind of like uh, an exaggeration of, of sort of like typical anxiety. Um, but that the, the threat must be in juxtaposition with another threat, so that the individual cannot avoid one threat without being confronted by another. So it's a sort of um, double bind. Uh, the values held essential to existence as a personality are in contradiction with each other. So what this means is that, um, to give to give like um, a, a personal example, one value for me, and, and what triggers a lot of anxiety, um, is staying safe from illness um, and germs because I have OCD and this, um, I, I've had OCD for a long time um, and this uh, obviously was before um, the onset of COVID um, and it's obviously got a lot worse because of COVID. Um, so there's that uh, value, a very strong value that I held very dear um, about trying to stay safe from, from germs and from illness. Um, but by um, ordinarily, I mean obviously with COVID it's a bit different because there's like a realistic risk, but ordinarily this fear um, of trying to stay safe was holding me back. So the other value that I, that I have might be I want to try and um, I want to try and live, I want to try and develop myself, I want to try and grow and that obviously involves trying to go out and trying to do things that um, trigger uh, for fear of getting ill, you know, just everyday things such as say going on a train or, you know, anywhere where I might have a fear of that I might get contaminated, but obviously if I stayed at home all the time and I didn't try and face those fears, then um, I would be um, not living. So those are like the two values that were in conflict there. So, um, so there are two threats, the threat of um, getting sick, uh, or, you know, or like contaminating myself, um, and then the threat um, of not living and not moving forward, so a sort of double bind, so if I go forward I'm obviously going to get triggered by my OCD, but then if I don't go forward then I'm not living. So that's just giving a personal example of that conflict within nautic anxiety, but obviously within all anxiety. Um, so I've mentioned this before in the other videos, but um, it's argued that anxiety is our human awareness of the fact that each of us is a being confronted with non-being. And non-being um, can be anything from death, which is, I guess is the most extreme version of that, um, severe illness, but also things such as like a too sudden change or something that threatens our sense of like a psychological equilibrium. Um, it's argued that, constructive, um, that anxiety can be used constructively uh, one example of a constructive use of anxiety is, for example, the healthy child's learning to walk, despite the fact that um, he falls and gets hurt many times. So when we're learning to walk, um, we have to face the anxiety that we might fall down, um, but that happens a lot when we're learning to walk, but we still get up and keep on going because there's like developmental momentum, this need to try and get on our feet so that we can better explore branch out into the world but we if we don't get past those shocks then we won't learn to walk but of course nearly every single human being apart from those who are like physically disabled does eventually learn how to walk 
Um, so in anxiety, there's often a sense of adventure there. Um, or there might just be determination to kind of fight through the anxiety. And that's a constructive use of anxiety um, to try and see it as like a challenge or like an adventure. Um, the person is subjectively prepared to confront the unavoidable anxiety constructively um, when they are convinced that the values to be gained in moving ahead are greater than those to be gained by escape. As I, as I mentioned earlier when I was trying to uh, tackle Mosey D prior to the coronavirus outbreak. So now there's no way I can really tackle it because, you know, it's, there is a genuine risk out there. But before the coronavirus pandemic, when my, when it was a more kind of neurotic anxiety as opposed to realistic anxiety, I guess you could call it, um, I was trying to kind of work through it. Obviously it was really difficult, but I was I really, really wanted to try and branch out, so I was trying really hard. Um, so yeah, so the anxiety then is conflict between values and goals. The conflict between the threat and the values the person identifies with their existence. In a neurosis, it's argued the struggle is usually won by the threat because the person tends to withdraw, the anxiety gets too much, they might not go out. The conflict is won by the threat, but in a constructive use of anxiety, the uh, struggle is won by the higher value, which makes them, which sort of propels them forward despite the, despite the anxiety. Um, so yeah, the struggle is won by the individual's values, for example, with satisfaction to be achieved by wider use of their own powers, for example, um, at a very basic level, that would be the child's learning to walk. But also, scientists and artists, they get anxious whenever they develop new art forms, new hypotheses. These provide shocks to their existence, because it's a new truth. The adventure of moving into unexplored fields. Um, this all brings with it anxiety, but it's also sufficiently rewarding. Um, to make them go forward despite the anxiety. So they move ahead despite the threat of isolation and anxiety. Um, now, it's argued by someone called Eric Fromm. Um, do go out and check out Eric Fromm's work. I have read it myself. Um, the Same Society is a great read and Oscar Fear of Freedom are two of the great works. He's a, he's a great... Do go and read him. He's a, he's, you can see him on YouTube as well. He's dead now. But if you Google Eric Fromm, do go and check out his interviews. He, he seems a really great, compassionate person. Um, his heart's in the right place. He does seem like a really nice person. And I do agree with a lot of what he says as well. So do go and check him out. Um, he's, he's a philosopher. Or was a philosopher. And I think a psychoanalyst as well. But he argues that... Um, what drives people forward despite their anxiety is what he calls the ultimate concern, the frame of orientation and devotion, or the religious attitude towards life. That doesn't mean religious in a sort of supernatural, metaphysical sense. It's using a word to mean that the person is very passionately devoted uh, to something that almost becomes like a religion to them. Yes, I can really, really relate to this on a secular level, um, usually. I can really relate to this um, because, and I think it's often, it's, it happens in autism, because we get really very, um, some would say obsessed, or you could just say very passionately engrossed or extremely interested in, in something that then becomes our whole driving force in our life. It's not just a hobby. It literally becomes who we are, like it takes over our life. And it's ultimate concern. Uh, can actually be quite helpful if we can use it to try and uh, overcome, say, our anxieties and, um, in a sense, use it constructively, maybe, to try and use it as a coping strategy to... It's like autism self-healing me uh, mechanism, I call it. Autism's funny like that. <laughs> it's got a sort of self-healing mechanism within it. It's sort of special interests or like a kind of, um, yeah, nature's way of preventing autism from getting too depressing, I guess. <laughs> um, but yeah, negative effects like anxiety can be overcome in the long run only by more powerful constructive effects. Affects, for example, um, our interest. Yes, I, I can really, really relate to that so much because, um, as I say, I'm really anxious, but there have been times in my life when the intensity of my interest, notably when I was really interested in Kate Winslet and babies, um, motivated me to uh, audition 
um, for uh, the Tour de Force Theatre Company when it was still in existence, all because of Kate Winslet's sister, because she was in it, seeing a previous year's play. As I told you in a previous video, I would not have done that if I wasn't so interested. Otherwise, all I would have had was anxiety, but because the interest was so strong, it meant I didn't get anxious because I was just so excited to do it because the interest was so intense. And when I volunteered at a nursery school, despite my OCD, as you can imagine, little toddlers can be quite germ infested and this was like a height of my OCD I wouldn't normally have done that but because I was so obsessed with babies because Kate Winslet had just had a baby and I was obsessed with babies in the own right but also it's very much connected to Kate Winslet and her baby and it kind of, kind of became a splinter of interest I um, went to his nursery school despite the photos lots of coughing snotty nose toddlers around me uh, the anxiety was assuaged, assuaged I think that's what I read to um, a significant extent just because of the intensity of my interest um, so yes, there's more to be uh, more at stake, more to be achieved in moving ahead again and fleeing when you have this ultimate concern. Um, when anxiety is severe, as I know all too well, it can of course greatly affect your productivity. It's paralysing, it's exhausting. But um, it, it can either inhibit, with me it usually inhibits, but it can sometimes facilitate performance and that all depends on its strength. So obviously if it's really extreme, it will inhibit. But if it's at a kind of optimum level where it's not too extreme, but it's manageable, we can actually sometimes spur the person on, I guess a bit like, say, pre-exam nerves, which can sometimes be quite helpful when you've got to, like, really focus for an exam or something, maybe. That could be an example of constructive anxiety, or when someone's about to go on stage, a little bit of anxiety can be quite helpful, as long as it doesn't paralyse them. Um, but yeah, there's, and also there's the creative uses of a gap between expectations and reality. Um, for example, imagination, science, art, ethics, and that's to bring one's expectations into reality, because it's a good capacity to deal with possible. Your creative ability is argued that creative ability, susceptibility to anxiety, are two sides of the same capacity. Um, because to become aware of the gaps between expectations and reality, that gap between expectations and reality, or what you want to bring into existence, results in anxiety because there's a possibility, and whenever there's a possibility of something new or of growth, there's anxiety. Um, but if he, um, in ordinary anxiety, um, this, this uh, expectation can potentially be brought into reality. So it's not neurotic. But in neurotic anxiety, the cleavage is in a form of a contradiction as the expectation of reality cannot be brought together. So that, that's because there's a neurotic distortion of reality then to relieve tension. So in neurotic anxiety, there's a kind of um, uh, distortion of reality. Um, because you sort of uh, uh, think that things can be a certain way even though they can't. It's almost like you think you can change something that can't be changed and then you try and um, rationalise it and sort of try to feel you can change it even though you can't change it kind of thing. Whereas in uh, reductive uh, anxiety, um, the expectations are not in contradiction to reality but they can be used as a means of creatively transforming reality. So then there's like a realistic goal and a person does stand a chance of actually bringing that goal into reality. There's obviously going to be anxiety there but it's not neurotic because it can potentially be achieved but it's still going to bring with it anxiety. Um, and it's argued crucially at the end that, and this is, this is like a main theme throughout the book, that the emergence of individual freedom is connected with anxiety. How the anxiety is met will determine whether the freedom is affirmed because the person moves forward despite the anxiety, or whether the freedom is sacrificed because the anxiety is too much and the person runs away from anxiety and withdraws. Um, and there's a quote from Kierkegaard, to venture causes anxiety, but not to venture is to lose oneself because you're then not actualising your true potential. Okay, so that brings my review to a close of this book, so um, of um, The Meaning of Anxiety. So I hope you enjoyed watching and now I'm going to move on to video number two and in the next video I won't be able to talk about this in great depth because I have, might have to come back to this, we'll see how we go on anyway, but one of you wanted me to talk about how I cope with daily living skills and so that's what I would like to talk about a little bit in video number two. So moving on to video number two now.